Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or simply hoping to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back, Richard. Today we're going to talk more about addiction, but this time we're going to talk about one of our favorite things in the world. One of our favorite topics. The brain. The brain. What happens in the brain and how does the brain relate to addiction? Right. Yeah, because much of what we know about addiction, there's, there's an important, another important concept here, an issue that we haven't discussed. Um, the abuse of substances, especially alcohol, was a much larger problem mm-hmm. um, in the late 1800s right. than it is today. I mean, it was it was a far more serious uh, consequences right. to families and to individuals, and so um, the um, initial um, surge, the initial opposition, of course, it was about the time of prohibition, mm-hmm. and so so. It was that period of time when when we defined what addiction is. Right. Well, we didn't know that much about mm-hmm. the brain in the 1930s, um, and so uh, the uh, definitions centered more on moral failings and that sort of stuff. Well, and that's when this whole thing about reefer madness and mm-hmm. marijuana being this terrible drug, all that was defined in the 1930s and grew out of this whole prohibition movement. Right. Since then, however, in the last, it's almost 100 years, 90 years, Mm -hmm. we've learned a lot about the human brain. Mm -hmm. And especially in in this topic, we've learned about um, how substances um, affect the brain. Yeah. And it leads to the idea of the brain of of substance use disorders being diseases rather than moral failings. Right. But it all begins with this discussion of the brain. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll talk more about the moral failings idea. Right. That comes uh, later. Tomorrow. But this is wh- this is why, because right. now we understand what these substances do. We're, we have a much better understanding of what these substances do to the human brain. Right. So we want to talk. start out talking about, as we're talking about the brain, sort of the, the way in which um, I, I think a lot of confusion about substance abuse is introduced because of talking about the brain, right? If that makes sense, right. um, yeah, it adds to the confusion. It, it does in some ways, because right. what people will say is that well, it's an addiction because it triggers the reward centers in the brain, right. you know. And so, since it triggers the reward centers in the brain, it um, you know people are driven to uh, driven to do it, right. and it therefore turns into an addiction. Right. However, there, there's some big problems. <laughs> however, with that. yeah, and that's really important. It's a good place to pause. Because, yes, it does. The, the fundamental issue with the brain mm-hmm. is these substances trigger mm-hmm. um, the reward systems of our brain. Right. Okay. However. Right. So does, so does a, everything else. So does a lot of... That's right. Getting A's trigger right. the reward system of our brain. Right. Um, Reading a good book triggers the reward mm-hmm. system. Having somebody hold your hand. You yeah, know, like a young child takes your hand, a little baby, an infant. Yeah, you know, the, all of these things trigger the reward, right. the pleasure and reward systems of the brain. Right. So, so we do. We have to be careful that just because something is found to trigger the reward system in the brain doesn't mean that it's an addiction. Now, that said, let's admit that just about anything can become an addiction. Sure. One, yeah. a person can become, quote unquote, addicted to just about anything. And we're going to talk about the difference between psychological dependence and chemical dependence on Thursday, I think. <laughs> That's going to be Thursday's podcast. Right. It's hard to keep these yeah. separated. Right? But, but, but for now, the, the point is, is that anything that triggers the reward centers could technically turn into a, 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 an addiction. We're, we're revising our handbook right now. Mm-hmm. And in one of the sections, we write about how mothers um, are have these strong feelings about their babies because of the produce they produce oxytocin mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so that creates but you don't think in terms of I'm addicted to my infant right you know right. although it is exactly those same brain centers mm-hmm. that are um, um, 
activated when you hold an infant, when right. you hold your infant. Yeah. yeah. But you don't... But it's the same... Nobody areas. talks about, oh, I'm addicted to my neonate. Right. No. It's, it just sounds funny to say. Right. It even sounds funny. To, but that's that's what we'd be saying. But, but it's the same thing... Um, with positive behaviors, reading, right. you know, when do you ever talk about somebody being addicted to reading? Mm -hmm. But when you think about the behaviors, it could be exactly the same behaviors as you talk about with video games or exactly. cell phones or alcohol. Right. It could be the same stuff. So the point is we want to be careful right. about how we use these terms. And, and we, the reason we want to discuss this is we want to sort through this right. um, vocabulary right. so that we understand more clearly what, what right. we should be, what words we should be using and what they mean. Right. So do be cautious or, or not suspicious really, but just be mindful that anytime someone says, well, it's an addiction because it triggers the reward centers. Yes. You know, say mm -hmm. ah, that's great, you know, yeah. but let's get some more information. Or, or when, when somebody says your, your, your daughter seems to be addicted to her cell phone, um, you now know that may not be addiction, but it right. is something to think. Right. Now we at least want to think about it, but, right. but let's let's think about it very carefully. Right. Let's use caution. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, a another aspect of the brain and how it relates to addiction is the fact that uh, for many conditions, for many substance use disorders, mm -hmm. there is a brain base for that condition, for that, the, the use of that substance. Let's use right. an example real quick. Um, anxiety. anxiety. All right. So anxiety is a condition that is, that, that manifests, you know, if we think about it in very basic, simple terms uh, from the brain, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a lot going on in the brain. Right. You know, it's very active. It's very, um, you know, it, there, there's lots of neurons mm -hmm. firing related to, you know, so deep inside related to fears and anxieties and things like right. that, just to keep you safe, even though you're not really in danger. Right. Okay. Well, when we are going to prescribe medication for that, some of the medications we use are things called benzodiazepines, for example, Xanax, mm -hmm. um, and it, just as an example. And what that does is that calms the brain down. There's a neurotransmitter called GABA, uh, which stands for a big word, a big set of words that we're going to say. Um, but it's, it's, they, they work on GABA and increase GABA so that it calms the brain down. Mm -hmm. So it relieves anxiety in that way. Pretty quick, pretty straightforward. Now, what does alcohol do? Pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So if a person is really anxious, has his underlying anxiety, lots of activity going on in the brain, it's not that surprising that that person may resort to alcohol as a way to calm some of that anxiety. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the person could develop an addiction to alcohol, but there is the probability that that substance use mm -hmm. has its roots in the brain. Right. Because there is a need to increase GABA because That's the right. brain doesn't isn't producing an adequate supply to keep everything calm. And that's that's the essential problem. We have about a hundred chemicals racketing around in our brain every day. Right. And some of us don't produce enough or we produce too much right. of one of those substances. And so your brain sort of knows that mm -hmm. that it has this knowledge about itself and right. says, I need a little bit more of this or I need a little bit more of that. Right. And the, we have these substances that, lo and behold, they provide yeah. a little more of this or a little more of that. Right. And, and alcohol is one of those. Right. Right. Nicotine is another one. Nicotine. Nicotine is something else that calms right. things. Um, it, it's so it's not surprising when we see someone who experiences substance substance use disorders, mm -hmm. who then, um, as we kind of dig in and, and start looking at things, we find an underlying mental health condition. Right. In, in fact. It's our perspective right. that if a person has a substance use disorder, there's some underlying mental health condition that their mental health personality or even medical condition that mm -hmm. they are treating mm -hmm. with right. self-treating. Uh, there's my shutter quotes. There's self for self-medicating. Right, right. For, mm -hmm. for that condition. That's right. No, I, I agree. I think that if somebody is driven, they're driven to satisfy one of these chemical needs. Right. And you need a certain amount of each one of these to fun to feel normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because what do people come in and say? Well, I don't feel normal unless. Right. Well, what they're telling us. Why is, do you use it to relax? To relax. Why can't right. you relax without it? Yeah, that's right. Because 
what they don't know, what they don't realize is because they don't have enough of mm -hmm. that particular neurotransmitter right. that plays that role. Right. Yeah. So uh, another quick example of how it's how it's used is, you know, people will say, well, you know, I, I just go out when I go out and I go to a club right. or something, mm -hmm. I'll drink a little bit just to just kind to of relax, just to kind of take the edge off so right. I can dance and I can have a good time. Mm -hmm. All right. So we may be talking about sort of a social anxiety condition or something right. like that that's preventing you from being able to relax and express mm -hmm. yourself in that way, in a way that you would like to right. otherwise. Or, or normally my, my temperament is I'm shy and inhibited, mm -hmm. okay? But if I add a little alcohol to that, right. it takes away some of that because of the effect that it has on those chemicals in my brain. Right. You know, so then you, it's okay to talk more mm -hmm. and dance more and be a little bit silly. Absolutely. Because you've you've reduced uh, you have you have less inhibition. Right. Okay. So so, so with this as our as our um, basis, right. Let's talk about the issue of um, the addiction gene. Right. Do People we, refer hmm. to that all the time, and so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to hopefully make it very very simple. I don't believe in an addiction gene. No. I, I don't. We're, there's not going to. We're not going to someday discover, oh, there it is. Right. There's no. uh, on the uh, 23rd no. chromosome, if we just... No. no. Instead, the the hypothesis, I think, that we should really be going after is the fact that if substance abuse is often driven, typically driven, always driven, by. perhaps, by an underlying mental health personality mm -hmm. disorder or something to that effect, right. that fits very nicely with the idea that there is a heritability to mental health conditions. But what are you inheriting? So you're inheriting anxiety, that's, for example. You're inheriting your parents' brain chemistry. Right. I mean, that's that's what we inherit. Right. We inherit their shoe size and their eye color and their hair color and their body type. Well, we also, where else would our brain chemistry come right. from? It has to come from our parents' brain chemistry. Right. So if your parents tend to be shy, uninhibited, mm -hmm. you tend to be shy and uninhibited. Right. So it's not that you inherited their addiction. Right. You inherited their brain chemistry. You took care of your own addiction. Right. And, and again, addiction defined as, um, you know, self-treatment. Using, right, right. So, so it, it's, it's not, and let's, let's extend that to the fact that, oh, well, he has an addiction, addictive personality, mm -hmm. and so he went from this addiction to that addiction to, you know, he's not, you know, right. using that substance anymore, but now he's gambling all the time. Well, what we know is that gambling and some of these other, you know, jumping out of airplanes right. and some of those kinds of extreme behaviors, those increase certain chemicals right. in the brain. Same, right. The same thing, mm -hmm. same chemicals right. that other behaviors mm -hmm. increase. Mm -hmm. And so we're not talking, we're not really talking about anything that's different. Right. It's, but when we talk about addiction, what we're talking about is this need for this substance. Right. Not the substance. But what the substance does right. to our brain. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so again, the the, the bottom line, the take right. home take message home. is right. um, when we do when people abuse a substance, they're doing so to change the brain in some way. Mm -hmm. Either to either to relax or to excite or to um, you know, just to alter reality in some way. Right. Mm -hmm most of the time, if not all of the time, that is in response to some underlying mental health or physical health or, right. or some kind of personality, temperamental type of uh, condition mm -hmm. that's making it where that change is necessary to right. feel quote unquote normal mm -hmm. or to feel um, you right. know, themselves or how right. they would like to feel. And the other thing to remember, and I'm gonna touch on this here, we may, revisit it later in the mm -hmm. week but the other thing about um this adding these substances to our brain um when we add these substances to our brain they have a tendency to jolt the system right. a little bit more that mm -hmm. in other words um i can go out today um and and be with my children right and that will make me feel that will bring me pleasure mm -hmm. okay um, and, and that will produce a certain amount of a brain chemical, mm -hmm. dopamine. Mm -hmm. okay? um, but it's a normal amount that makes right. me feel good. If I go out and take other substances, 
mm-hmm. I could have two to ten times more dopamine. Right. So I could flood the whole system, right. which really gives me a, a, mm-hmm. a pleasurable feeling. Now we're talking about the effects of, of substances right. rather than the effects of normal life events. Right. Right? And when you do that, you start to tinker with brain chemistry right. and, and actually brain structure. Right. right. Yeah, the brain changes when we're using the substance. And that's where we get into, um, as we'll talk about um, on Thursday with chemical right. dependence and psychological mm-hmm. dependence, we're going to talk about what happens in the brain when we're using these substances and how how it changes the way the brain works. That's right. That's right. It gives you a jolt. Yeah. Uh, and and some people like that jolt. I right. mean, it really feels good. Right. Uh, people use cocaine that right. way and, and other substances like that where it's, wow, this really feels good. I remember the first time I took, I don't even remember what it was, I had um, uh, bronchial spasms. Mm-hmm. I couldn't breathe. And they probably gave me Valium, mm-hmm. I'm guessing, in those mm. days. Wow. Yeah. It does make you feel good. I mean, yeah. Um, and I can, you, you begin to understand why people, mm-hmm. um, or or you have surgical procedures mm-hmm. and you say, wow, that was the best sleep I've ever had. Yeah. I want to do that again. Right. Know? And that's, that's the day, because it's a, it's a more powerful, it's an, it's an, it's an, it's a normal effect, but it's an exaggerated normal effect. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that it does change the way, especially if you're using chronically, it changes the way your brain it functions. Your and brain. so we'll, we'll talk right. about that um, mm-hmm. on Thursday. So it does have these, these true brain effects. Yes. Now, and, but the question becomes is, just because you're changing the brain, does that necessarily make this a medical condition like by diabetes right. or... or um, um, some other medical problem right. that we typically think of. And that becomes a, a discussion for another day, but that's what we need to think about. Is, it a, is, is, the, is substance use um, a medical, biological problem, or is it a moral, right. ethical problem? And that will be the topic of tomorrow. And we're coming up to that. So right. that is it for today? Mm-hmm. I know, but we could go on and on. How about talking we? about the brain? So, yep, that's it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. Thanks for sharing this episode of the Mental Breakdown and Psych Ridge podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you will find all of our previous podcasts and much more. We would be honored if you would become a patron through patreon.com, where any donation you can manage will go to the development and creation of more content. Just visit patreon.com slash the mental breakdown for more information. Thanks again for listening. Have an awesome day, and we look forward to being back in your feed tomorrow morning.